So again, thank you for being here, and I really want to thank Beth Reinhard for being here. Um, she is now covering national politics at the Wall Street Journal. This is a fairly recent gig. Previously, she was at National Journal uh, as a national political correspondent. Covered, she's covered several presidential elections. Um, because before that, she was at the Miami Herald, where she covered local, state, and national, sometimes national politics. Um, she had a number of editors at the Miami Herald, um, one of whom really stood out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, and <clears throat> because I've known Beth for a long time, I'll tell you one story, and I, I tell this story every time she speaks, and I'm not sure she even remembers it happening, but it's a way of, of expressing why I have so much respect for Beth as a reporter. Um, in addition to what she actually, the copy she actually produces, she is really, um, and has been for a long time, a master of interviewing and of being able to really focus on what she's trying to get and, and how to get it. So she and I were working together at the Miami Herald, and we were in a small office, a bureau in Fort Lauderdale. And it was a typical afternoon, and everybody's sitting around in a big open room, and you know, Beth's sitting behind me, and I hear her on this interview, and I notice that she's particularly focused, and she's asking question after question, and I realized that she, she was talking to a member of some local, um, like a water board or something, who we had heard was involved in a little scandal. And I don't even remember the details of the scandal. It may have had to do with, with his wife, and yeah, I don't even remember the details. But to make a long story short, she was on the phone for like 15 or 20 minutes, and by the end of the conversation, the entire newsroom was listening, because she was asking like the same question. Because I was question. so loud. <laughs> no, she'd ask the same question, but in a little different way. And then she'd ask it again a little different way, and then again a little different way. And it was clear she was trying to get this guy to say something, and he was evading, and you know, and she kept honing in and honing in and honing in, and then finally she said, "So." What you're saying is, ba 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 ba, you know, thank you very much. When she hung up the phone, I've never seen this hap happen before or since, the entire newsroom started clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, there was applause for that. And that, you know, just um, again, emblematic of the, the kind of, when you're going to do political reporting or any kind of reporting, you really have to be focused on the details know what you're looking for and be able to ask the questions in a way that you're going to get the information you want. Um, so Beth does that well. She's going to talk to us this morning um, a little bit about covering campaigns, covering elections. Really glad she's here. I'm going to stop talking. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm looking around at the names. I recognize a lot of bylines here. You all could probably talk, sit in this chair as well as I could. But um, anyway, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, so. Um, Linda asked me to talk about, um, this is always much better with questions and answers, but um, I'll just tell you one little story from my um, recent um, travails uh, as a political reporter. Um, as I, I'm sure many of you know, like covering national politics is, um, can be difficult because, you know, your access to the, to the candidates can be pretty limited. Um, especially when they're Hillary Clinton. I don't know that anyone's gotten very close to Hillary Clinton in some time. But so in kind of a sign of the times, um, I recently was asked to do a story about, uh, and, and this just shows you how many degrees of separation it is. Um, you know, you'll remember a few weeks ago, um, Hillary Clinton gave an interview to um, Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic magazine where she suggested that, you know, she would have done things differently than, than President Obama when it came to, um, you know, fighting these Islamic terrorists. And, and um, you know, she said something like, uh, you know, don't do something stupid is not a nas na national strategy. You all remember that. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sure someone in our office wrote about that interview. So that, you know, is us writing about an interview that Hillary Clinton gave to someone else. So then, you know, of course, there was all the reaction to the interview, and um, and of course, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, reaction these days is happening on Twitter, and um, so we're you can see we're going lower and lower here. Um, and David Axelrod had tweeted something that sort of sounded like a, a jab, where he said, um, you know, let's remember, you know, don't do stupid stuff. Uh, 
you know, also applies to not getting into wars that we shouldn't be in, basically sort of a referring to her vote for the Iraq war. Um, and uh, my editor asked me to follow up on that. I tried to reach out. I, I did reach out to David Axelrod. He's usually has been responsive to me. He was not, which was sort of a clear sign to me that he wanted to kind of throw that grenade and then let it speak for itself and let the explosions occur as they may. So I find myself writing a story about something David Axelrod tweeted that he won't explain in reference to an interview that Hillary Clinton gave to another reporter. So <laughs> that's the very glamorous life as uh, covering national politics uh, these days, um, perhaps at, a, at its worst moment, but unfortunately a not infrequent moment. Um, as, as you all know, the, the best days are, you know, when you're out breaking your own ground, finding your own stories, um, doing something that no, perhaps no one else has, has um, noticed or um, paid attention to. Maybe you're not even talking to um, a national figure at all. You're talking to a regular voter or a, you know, chairman of a county party or you're looking at records. Um, those, of course, are where, where the best stories generally come from. And, you know, the days where I, I find myself really frustrated by lack of access to the, the camp candidate or even to the campaigns, you know, the can't get the flack to return your calls, can only get them to email you, uh, you know, something very formulaic, you know, you have to remind yourself that those are not where your best stories are going to come from anyway. They're going to come from going around those folks to people who are, um, you know, usually a lot more more chatty. Um, and, and, and I think the best case is, you know, you kind of have your story before you even go to the campaign. Um, the campaign is maybe your, even your last stop before your story's done. You know, say, hey, this is what I'm writing about. What's, what do you have to say about it? Um, is really, I think, the best position to be in. But, um, you know, reality is that, of course, there's pressure on all of us to, to crank out a lot of stories. And so we end up writing about stuff, silly stuff that happens on Twitter. Um, so um, just uh, to tell you a little more about myself, I'm, I've been at the Wall Street Journal for six months um, and um, writing about the midterms and also keeping an eye on the 2016 Republican field for the most part. Um, so as, as you know, as I'm sure you all know, the, the, the presidential pre 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 primary is, is well underway. Um, at, at National Journal before that. Um, I actually have had, since I came to Washington, a very Republican focus, which is actually not a bad thing because I think the Republican Party is going through um, some really interesting stuff right now. So um, also covered, covered the 212 campaign at National Journal, mostly writing about the Republican side. And then at the Miami Herald for a while before that, um, as Linda said, I wrote about local politics. I wrote about state politics. I wrote about um, governor's races. Um, the last race I covered at the Herald was the Senate race between Marco Rubio and Charlie Crist. It's probably the most fun I've ever had. Um, and I covered the 2008 um, presidential campaign from Florida, um, which was interesting because um, I don't know if you remember this, but you know the Democratic Party was really trying to sort of crack down on, on the the um, nominating calendar and um, the parties um, said that if um, they didn't move back the, the date of the primary, Florida had moved it up, um, they were going to ban the candidates from campaigning in Florida, which they did. So <laughs> it was like the most exciting presidential primary ever, but it didn't take place in, in Florida. Um, anyway, that was a lot of fun too. Um, but what's funny is now, um, you know, I've gotten, uh, I'm not really sure how, to this great big newspaper covering um, national politics. And sometimes I look back on stories I did at the Miami Herald or even earlier in my career at the Palm Beach Post covering local races. And um, I, I really like, I, I find that the, some of those stories were, were even more fun than what I'm doing now just because you can get so much closer to what's happening. And, and it's sort of a smaller playground, which allows you to kind of drill down a little deeper. Um, but anyway, but of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be where I am and, and covering national politics is a, is a great playground to be in. Um, so let me just open it up. And, and if you all have questions about, you know, I don't know, anything, working at the Wall Street Journal, covering national politics, covering Republicans, um, whatever. Um, why I chose to wear a blazer as opposed to a cardigan. I, 
<laughs> I did go back and forth. Well, I was going to ask something else, but that's a tricky. Um, so what uh, what storylines are you starting to think about? You know, we're in the two month sprint now, yeah. in November. So what sort of like top of mind that you're thinking about going into this election? Right. Well, um, the way I think about it, I mean, there's kind of a couple of different ways to look at the midterms. I mean, you can cover it race by race. You can say, you know, these are the top 10 Senate races or these are the top five House races. Obviously, there's not as many House races that are interesting. Um, and you can cover it that way, which we are doing that, some of that. And I have written um, kind of race profiles. Um, and then the other way I actually think is more fun to look at it is sort of in buckets of um, – you know, uh, kind of, uh, I guess we call it sort of identity politics, like looking at the black vote, um, which is going to be key in, in a lot of these races in the South, looking at the women's vote, which is, you know, women are basically the firewall between uh, between Democrats retaining the Senate and, and not, um, you know, to a much lesser extent, the Hispanic vote, you know, which is going to be big in Colorado mostly. Um, but of course, that's very interesting in, in light of what President Obama announced over the weekend with immigration. Um, and then, you know, there's also sort of the, the campaign tactics and money side of it, um, which I've personally written less about, but, you know, you're seeing a lot of coverage of that, you know, how much money Americans for, for Prosperity has been spending, how much um, Senate Majority PAC on the Democratic side has been spending, so much money from outside groups this cycle. Um, and uh, so there's kind of like different ways to cover it, and um, I guess that's the way I look at it. And so. In these last two months, I think you'll see a lot of stories about that and, and hopefully some stories that um, I, I'm hoping for myself, too, that really um, are more from the ground up than written from Washington. You know, um, I find it sort of we, we end up writing a lot of stories about, say, women voters that where we don't really talk to any women voters. We just talk to a bunch of, you know, Emily's List and, you know. So um, I'm hoping, um, though I have been able to travel some, I'm hoping to do some some more travel these last two months where I think, you know, voters are finally starting to pay attention, uh, maybe actually tune in to the, all these, this barrage of negative ads they've faced over the last few months and say, all right, I guess I got to, I got to listen now and, and not, uh, you know, for the DVR, because I am going to have to cast a vote in a couple months um, and really see what, what voters are uh, thinking about. And, you know, unfortunately, I have a feeling just from what we're seeing in the polls that um, obviously voters are feeling so discouraged. And um, I mean, that's kind of another story I'm hoping to get at before the end of the year um, at, you know, what's really happening out there in the electorate. It just uh, seems like people are really um, just about as cynical and depressed as, as they've ever been. Yeah. Um, well, like, you know, like, like you're meaning like today's the day you, they say, okay, we're going to have you write about, you know, the Congressional District 4 in Texas, like or that. Or you're assigned to that, like, for the entire Yeah, country. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a few things that I sort of do, that I do that, um, are pretty basic, but sometimes reporters forget to do them, so I'll, I'll just go over those, and hopefully they're not, it's, this isn't too redundant for you that I know a lot of you have experience. Um, I mean, one thing I do, one of the first things I do, besides obviously getting on the press list for the campaigns, is I sign up for the emails that the campaign is sending out, like, to their supporters. Like, you know, you go to the website and you can, like, pretend that you're going to give money and, and sign up for emails. And, you know, 99% of those emails will be a waste of your time, but every once in a while the, the campaign is sending out um, something to its supporters or trying to get a message out that perhaps they're not flagging as much to the press. Um, so that's helpful. I mean, I, I kind of think of it as like when you're when you first get that assignment, your your first step is all about backgrounding, backgrounding the candidates, backgrounding the sorry the district that you're covering. So you're going to get on the email list. You're going to get the candidate's resume, and you're going to actually call their universities that they said they went to, and you're going to call the law firms that they said they worked at, and verify all that because, as you know, people are still to this day making stuff up. You're going to go to the candidate's house that they said they lived in on their, um, you know, when they filed their uh, statement of candidacy to see if they actually live there, um, like the Washington Post did recently with Mary Landrieu. Um, you know, you, it, these things don't just happen in, on city council races. They happen when people are running for the Senate. 
Um, you're going to look at their financial disclosure forms. You're going to, you know, take a very close look at where they're getting their money from. And of course, you know, there's great, great websites now, um, Center for Public Integrity and others that um, open secrets that are that are helping, you know, very helpful with trying to figure out um, where the money is coming from. Um, Another thing that you want to do is in not just getting to know the candidates, you want to get to know the place that they're running in. So if you're talking about a congressional district, um, you, know, you want to get like either the almanac or, or some other way to find out how that district is voted. Do they vote for Obama? And if so, by how many points? You know, do they have an influx of, of Hispanics into the district? And if so, where do they live? Um, you know, is is uh is it lean democratic does it lean republican are there you know you want to get to know the district as, as well as you get to know the candidates um and then you want to try your best to try to set the agenda yourself i mean obviously the candidates are going to want to talk about what they want to talk about you know if it's this year the republicans are going to tell you how how terribly uh president obama has done as as a president if it's democrats are going to want to tell you the republican is is too extreme for voters in this country you're going to have to try to get past all that noise and say actually what voters really want to talk about is you know the energy or or whatever it is um you want to follow the ads obviously that the that the candidates are running but also what the outside groups are doing um that has become in some cases even more important than what the candidates and parties are doing themselves or what what the outside groups are doing um what else do you want to do Oh, another little thing that reporters often forget is you want to check on the candidate's voting record. Um, obviously, you can't find out how they voted, but you can find out whether they voted. I think that's true in almost every state. Um, and if they didn't vote in the Republican primary when, you know, their supposed best friend was on the ballot um, or the governor was on the ballot who's been campaigning diligently for them, you know, that's a story. Um, so, again, these are kind of the stories that reporters, like, you know, they're kind of the very basics that uh, I think a lot of us tend to forget about, especially when we in Washington, we think we don't have to do those kind of stories anymore. But those are still really good stories. Um, another little secret I get I, I have discovered for talking to voters is the best place to go to talk to voters. I used to always go to Dunkin Donuts and I found that, you know, as if you went anywhere to talk to voters, you know, a lot of people are rushing on their way to work. They really just don't want to talk to you, um, which is understandable. But at a gas station, when people are where people are pumping gas and held captive for, you know, a good five to seven minutes is a great place to interview voters because they can't get away from you. <laughs> so go out to your congressional district or, or uh, whatever, wherever the playground is that you're writing about and go to a gas station. Um, in, in the part of the district that matters the most and talk to voters there. Those would be kind of my basics. Yeah. How do you separate, okay, the you're a human being for I imagine you have your own biases and political inclinations that you may not know publicly, but how do you separate that with the reporting of the candidate? I've had very little political reporting or campaign reporting and in other areas, it seemed very easy to remove myself in that. It was a little challenging for me. How do you do that? You know, I actually don't find it that hard because so I find, like, sometimes candidates that actually I would agree with most on the issues to be, like, incredibly distasteful. And I find candidates who I don't agree with on anything to be just utterly charming and persuasive and um, charismatic. And I mean, I asked myself a, a pretty simple, I don't even have to ask myself, like I'm sitting there watching a candidate. The question is, do I feel anything when that candidate is speaking? You know, most of the time we don't because they're just going through talking points. But, you know, I have felt something on occasion when the president speaks. I've felt something when Marco Rubio speaks. And they're obviously at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, so, um, you know, for me, it's sort of a visceral reaction. And I, I also just look at our job as like, holding these folks accountable. And if they're being deceptive about their record, um, whether they're Democratic, Republican, it doesn't really matter to me. I want to hold their feet to the fire and say, well, the position you're taking now is much different than how you voted as a state senator back in, you know, seven years ago. So um, you just kind of look at it as like you're the referee 
And um, even if ideologically you might agree or find what they're saying very disagreeable, I mean, how persuasive are they? How um, appealing are they? Are they likable? Um, are these people that you would, you know, that you think voters are going to look at and say, that's someone I would, you know, because a lot of times I think voting is really based on that kind of visceral reaction is, you know, is this someone that I would like to be around? So um, I actually don't find it that hard. But um, if you do, you just have to kind of set, maybe write down some criteria, like, you know, how persuasive is this person? You know, how, um, how candid are they being? Um, you know, what about their physical presence on, on stage or during a debate? You know, someone who can be, um, you know, a, a pretty disagreeable person could actually be, or I shouldn't say disagreeable, but someone who you disagree with can be a fantastic debater. And you have to be able to kind of judge that separate from your personal feelings. I think you can do it. Yeah. Um, I have some questions. How often do you get pressure to share your draft, you know, the draft of your stories before publishing from your sources? And also when you're writing your stories, what audience do you have in mind? Like, do you really think the middle America person is the one who's going to be reading your story? Or are you writing for other journalists in Washington or for politicians? When, when you say share the drafts, you mean like with the campaigns? Well, yeah, with, with the campaigns or just with um, the source that's really good interviewing. Sources that want to yeah. Say, well, how did you quote me? What's right. The tone? Right. I mean, it's really dangerous to um, email anything to a source that is something that is in your draft. I would not, generally not do that. Um, what I will do, and, and why, because then they have a record of what you said, and then if the story ends up changing, I think that's gonna create problems for you. Um, what I will do is, I will read back a quote um, if someone asks me to do that. Um, though I prefer not to. I just think, again, you can get yourself in trouble. Oh, I didn't really mean that. What I meant was that. And you end up kind of negotiating over the quote. Um, the one time where I think it's, it's probably a good idea is when you're writing about something really technical and you want to make sure, did I get this right? Again, I would be reluctant to email it. But I wouldn't mind saying, this is how I'm describing what happened, or this is how I'm describing. Like, let's say you're writing about um, the way a campaign has is, is got this great new data program. It's really technical, um, and you're just not a data person, and you want to make sure you have it right. You know, I will read a few paragraphs, or the kind of the gist of the paragraphs, and, and say, is, is, do I have this right? And that's not quotes. These are, you know, just your own sentences where you're explaining how something works. It's, it's usually a good idea, or if you're, um, I'm trying to think of another example, if you wanna, you know, going over numbers and stuff like that. Um, so, but in terms of like, will I share a draft of the story? I mean, no, never. I'm, I mean, I think most media outlets would say it's their policy not to do that anyway. Um, what was the other question? Who's your audience? Oh, your audience. yeah. I mean, I think some of it depends on where you work. Like, whether if you work for kind of a more niche kind of place or whether you work for a more mainstream kind of place, you have to alter how you write. Like, I probably wrote a little differently for National Journal than I – or I definitely wrote a little differently for National Journal than I wrote for the Miami Herald because National Journal has a very inside the Beltway audience. And now I'm writing, a, again, a little bit differently for the Wall Street Journal, which has, again, a different audience and also a different style, different expectations. Every newsroom has, um, you know, like, can you just say super PAC without explaining what it is? You know, in some places, oh, of course. But in other places, they're going to want you to explain it every time you say it. But in general, I mean, I want to make the, rep the writing as accessible as possible. I want, you know, my mom to be able to read it and enjoy it. Um, I that, that's a pretty high bar. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I want it to be as you know conversational and chatty and down to earth as possible. So I that's at least my style. I I'm, I'm I don't want to write for insiders, but of course, a lot of the stories that we write are for insiders. But um, you know, in some ways, you're writing for yourself. I mean, I I feel like. Um, that's really, I mean, that sounds in a way kind of obnoxious, but um, that's who I'm really trying to please the most. Yeah, back there. Um, looking forward to the 2016 presidential election, you gave me the longer news cycle and the longer campaign cycle. How do you write stories 
Democrat candidates who oftentimes you know that voters and readers are already sick of hearing about, but that they're going to have to be reported on for years before they, the race is done? How do, I'm sorry, say that again? How do you, how do you make, you know, writing about Hillary Clinton, say, interesting? Yeah. Given that everybody else is writing about it, and given that now the, the campaign cycle is stretched, you know, longer than it used to be. Right, right. I mean, that also kind of depends where you're working, but, um, you know, I I wouldn't want to write about Hillary Clinton, a story about Hillary Clinton every day. I would want to kind of pick the most interesting ones. But, um, I mean, again, I think that kind of depends on what the expectations of your, of your boss is. And, um, you know, if the expectations are to write every little turn of the screw and, and how, to, how to make that interesting, I mean, I think that's that's probably going to be difficult. Um, you know, you, I guess you assume that not everyone is going to read every story you write, so maybe it won't be as redundant as it feels to you as it does to the reader. Um, you know, maybe you, you just try to put uh, everything into... Um, a, a wider context. For example, the story I was telling you about um, writing about David Axelrod's tweet. Okay, so I wrote the way I did it to kind of save my sanity that day was I, I kind of ha- I tried to have a little fun with it. Like, you know, I don't remember exactly what the lead was, but, but it was something to the effect of like, you know, interest it it reflected how under scrutiny Hillary Clinton was like that was sort of the larger meaning I took of it and I kind of made fun of the fact that we're talking about a tweet what um, I think it was the Washington Post did what I thought was a really good job with that story what they did was they said you know this whole controversy is a result of the fact that the president hasn't really groomed a successor is it Joe Biden, not really. Is it Hillary Clinton? Not really either. I thought that was like a really smart way of writing about something small. Um, They actually took a larger meaning out of it that was pretty reasonable. I mean, sometimes these things can be stretched and and made to be ridiculous. I saw a story today about Rob Portman will be a viable presidential candidate if the Supreme Court rules in favor of gay marriage. I thought... That was a little bit of a stretch as far as I'm concerned. I mean, he's a viable candidate or not, I I think, regardless of what the Supreme Court does. But um, so I think in every story you write, you know, you have to kind of ask yourself that basic nut graphy question, why should anyone care? And, you know, you can you can try to make every story something, you know, something that people can learn about that candidate or that race. Can you talk a little bit about source management? I often find covering politics, I'm like playing politics myself. Meaning? I just, you're always trying to like, like uh, your example of when you were interviewing, you know, trying to get information, being a little coy, or there, there's just a lot of different, you know, balls you're always juggling with your sources. Um, I mean, that's really, uh, um, there's a lot of things that you do as far as source management. I mean, Okay, here's, I'll just tell you, give you a few examples. So um, a spokesman for the DNC was trying to pitch me on a story, which I thought was not a story. And so I said, I'm not going to do that story, which annoyed that person a little bit. And I want to maintain a relationship with that person. So a couple days later, I needed a quote, like a total throwaway quote. could have come from any Democrat on my source list. But I went to that person and I said, because I, I knew they, you know, everyone likes to see their name in the paper. Everyone wants to be promoting the organization they work for, in this case, the Democratic National Committee. And so I said, um, I need a quote along these lines. And, you know, that person was happy to give me. And so in a way, I felt like that was kind of managing that that source. Um, I mean, probably the most important thing to do, which I don't know how well I do it because we're always working on the next story, is calling your sources when you don't need anything and you, you're not needing a quote, and you're just like, hey, what's up? And maybe you're trading a little information. Did you see this? What did you think of that? Um, what should I be writing about is a question I try to ask every before I hang up the phone with anybody. You know, what, what should I be writing about this week? Um, so that's one thing. Um, 
you know, another thing I do is um, it's tempting to go back to the same people because they are available and, you know, usually quick with the quote. And, um, you know, it's I may be less source management than for sort of the integrity of your work. Like you want to have a diversity of people that you quote. Sometimes I think, geez, I've, I haven't like quoted, you know, there's not a single woman quoted in this story. Or, you know, I haven't talked to an African-American or a Hispanic um, and, you know, there was actually kind of, this is not source management, there was something interesting I saw the other day on Twitter about Twitter, like people um, not following people on Twitter who basically look like them as opposed to um, following a diverse range of voices. And I kind of examined my own Twitter, you know, Twitter feed with that in mind. Um, I don't know. Any, what other specific questions do you have about source management that I haven't answered? Um. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit about your thoughts on interviewing and when politicians are being evasive. Oh, right. Um, yeah, so, you know, you usually start off friendly, um, and you only play kind of hardball when you have to. Um, it's not something that's, you know, any, you know, I guess some people enjoy it. I mean, you kind of have to be willing as a reporter to have uncomfortable silences and tension. Um you have to be willing to stay on the phone when it's clear the other person is ready to get off the phone. And you just have to be like, okay, I know this person can't stand me, and I'm really pushing my luck here, but I'm going to, you know. A and other times just shutting up and letting that person talk um, sometimes is helpful. But, um, you know, I think you just uh, you kind of judge um, just like you do in your regular inner everyday interactions you're you know judging from social cues that you're getting from that person on the phone or in person about how to handle it I mean do they need a little stroking um, you know sometimes when people are hostile um, occasionally if you are um, you kind of give it right back to them it kind of like wakes them up to the fact that you know what you're not going to be messed with and some people will respect you for that you know other people like I said like need to be a little bit coddled um, I would say it's flirting, even though it's not like flirting, flirting. It's a little bit like flirting. Um, I really need you. I, I can't write this story without you. I really, there's another like little phrase yeah. I've come to use a lot. I really need your guidance. So in a way, you're not saying like, I need to quote you saying something embarrassing. Like saying I need your guidance is just like, I use that all the time to try to get people to call me back. Um, I really need your guidance on this story. Oh, my, you need my guidance. <laughs> yeah. Um, Would you also say, like, to the point about, like, being coy, um, at Politico sometimes we do roundtables and our more senior reporters will always stress, like, the best thing you can do is always be fair, like, and be upfront with your sources. Like, if you're going to have a story that's going to be negative and reflect them negatively, like, the way to keep those people around is just to be honest and, like, let your work show that at least you were fair. And right. Is that your experience as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, we have a rule at the Wall Street Journal, no surprises. Like, no one should read your story and be like, whoa, they said that about me? Like, you know, definitely be like, look, the story says, is going to say you did this. I have three people saying it. And, you know, I want to get your side. I want to be fair to you. Obviously, ab absolutely use that word fair. Because you do want to be fair. Um and uh, help me, help me show, and, and um, you know, it's going to look like you're stonewalling if I don't have a quote from you. I think it will, you know, so, like, you're giving them the opportunity. I've, I said this actually the other day, like, this is your opportunity to shape the story. They were being kind of belligerent with me. I was like, this is your opportunity to shape the story. Either you take it or you don't. I would love to have your input. I would love to hear your suggestions about the points I should make and who I should call, but you know, it's up to you. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hi. Hey, um, how do you, on sources, how do you um, navigate the murky world of anonymous sources and has that, how much has that changed depending on the publication you're with? Yeah, I mean, I, the minute I'm reading someone else's story and it has an anonymous source, I'm less interested. Um, it has less credibility. It's usually just easier for the reporter and it's, Often, we'll just take a few more phone calls to get someone to go on the record. Um, ag then again, there are stories that just you just won't be able to get anyone on the record. Uh, that's just the way it goes. And, and in that case, I think the trick is just getting a bunch of them so that you're positive that you're 
um, or I shouldn't say you're positive, but the reader can trust that you did your homework and, and putting out a lot, a lot of calls. Um, I did a story with a colleague the other day about Jeb Bush and whether he is running in 2016, and we talked to probably two dozen people, and um, very few people were willing to go on the record about stuff they had heard directly from the campaign. We did get a, we did get a couple which made the story, um, and you know, the Wall Street Journal doesn't look favorably on, I, I'm not gonna really get a lot of anonymous sources in the Wall Street Journal. Um, but I just think I see way too many anonymous sources quoted, um, and it'll be like, you know, President Obama has been a failed leader, said one blah, blah, blah. I'm like, come on, you can get that quote. Just make five more phone calls. Um, and, it may not even be as good a quote. It may be not as good a quote. Um, I will work with people who say I, you know, that they don't want to be quoted. I'll say, There's, okay, you don't want to say that. You don't want to say he's a jerk. But is there a more diplomatic way that I can get you that we can say that on the record? And um, a lot of times people will start off saying this is all off the record, and then at the end of the conversation you say, can I use that? And they'll be like, yeah, that's fine. And generally, that's just like kind of a, it's become sort of reflexive in Washington to be like, this is off the record. It, it, it's like brushing their teeth. They, it's off the record. And most of what they say is just so benign, you know, especially from people whose title is press secretary. Like, I have very little patience for press secretaries who want to be off the record. I mean, their job is to, or their, their title is communications, you know, like, <laughs> please. Um, so I think you're doing like all of us a disservice if you let people talk off the record because then they expect everyone to let them talk off the record. I think we all have to be really tough on people do the best we can to get the most people that we can on the record. I think if like with a little extra effort, you usually can get at least a little something, um, or make five more phone calls. Yeah. Can you talk about how you manage your day in terms of calling versus emailing and not conducting interviews over email but just like reaching out to people yeah. and also how you manage getting phone calls from people you've never heard of you say like hi it's Kate from so and so PR and you're like I don't know who you are and I've never heard of your organization I yeah time to talk to you. yeah so how do you I mean that's really harder than ever now um with Twitter because you know, I can find myself sucked into Twitter and email and not making phone calls and not doing any of my own reporting and just kind of like watching the world go by <laughs> on Twitter, watching other people post interesting stories on Twitter. And I'm just like, ah. So you really have to kind of manage it. Like you have to pay attention to Twitter. You have to manage your email. But you also have to work the phone. Um, I do find myself getting really lazy and emailing people instead of calling. Um, just because it's so e so easy, and in fact, I find people are now more way more responsive. So ideally, what I do is like I start off the day lazy, and I put out like five emails, like "Are you available to chat today?" is usually what the email says, and then and it's also more efficient. Actually, it's not just lazy because sometimes people like to sort of schedule their calls in between all their meetings and all that. And so the f if you started out calling, you would just get voicemail, and people don't like checking their voicemail anymore. Um, so I think you got to do a little both. Um, doing interviews over email is a last resort because um, if that's, you know, some of the only way you'll get someone, they're in a meeting, and they can email you back, they can't call you back, you know, obviously that you'll take it. But um, without that give and take, without the, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and, you know, people have too much time when they're emailing to kind of, like, make it sound, you know, it just never really sounds human and real. So, um, obviously, getting people on the phone is, is your first choice, and, and, and doing the interview by email is your last choice, but sometimes getting, sealing the deal, getting the connection, making that sort of deal by email, I think is, you know, that's the way things, people operate these days, which is fine. Um, I don't always answer the phone if I don't recognize the number, if I'm on deadline especially, because um, it will be that PR person. Um, you know, you want to obviously, you, you got to be really efficient. It's hard. It's hard. I think you have to kind of, be, you know, in, in the earlier question about how to cover a campaign, you have to kind of have the same um, attitude about, about your 
stories in that like you've got say six months to cover this campaign and so you're gonna have to do a whole bunch of silly stories a whole bunch of one day stories that you're not even remember writing but over that six months you know you'd like to have maybe four five six stories one story a month that you feel really good about that you feel like you know kind of set the agenda a little bit force the candidate to talk about something that they weren't planning on talking about um, and so if you can get a good story out once a month, then you're doing, you know, better than most um, while sort of doing all the other stuff, which includes tweeting, you know, or blogging and all those other things that we have to do. Um, but always keep your eye on the prize, that, that one story that people will remember, that you'll remember, um, that the campaigns will remember, perhaps not want to remember. Yeah. Daily, you wake up in the morning. What sources are you reading regularly? Yeah. Like, what do you do regularly to stay on top of going on? Right. Um, well, I'm old school. I get three newspapers at home. Um, I get the Wall Street Journal. I get the New York Times. I get the Washington Post, which I kind of force myself to flip through every morning. I frequently don't get through the papers until the, that night, but I at least kind of get the gist. And then the way I use Twitter is mostly as a news feed. Like I follow, most of the people in my Twitter feed are political reporters um, who I want to read. Um, I think a lot of people spend a lot of time on Twitter following, <sighs> following talking heads that um, it's probably not, it's take, maybe taking up too much of your time. I mean, I try to be really efficient about my use of Twitter because it is such a time suck. So I follow the New York Times political reporters I need to read, um, you know, and, and all the other political reporters that I find I, you know, I need to follow their work. That's 75% of my Twitter feed. So that's the way I'm consuming news the most. You know, following the reporter at MSNBC I need to follow and following the, you know, couple people at National Journal that I need to follow, so. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, okay. And then obviously looking at Twitter will send me to others. Like when I see what other journalists are tweeting, that sends me down. Oh, I don't usually read Salon, but that's a really good story. So, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if you have any advice about trying to find kind of like normal people and like, like you talk about going to like gas stations and meeting voters, but like sometimes, especially when you cover, like you work for a national paper and you have to, you can't fly out to whatever place you're right. trying to cover. How, do you have advice for like how to find those people via like the internet or? Because um, I know sometimes you don't want to just go to the campaign and have, like, their recommended Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot of times if you go to um, an industry-type group, like you can go to the Chamber of Commerce or the Small Business Association, do you have a member in, in that congressional district that I could talk to? Um, or you go to, um, I'm trying to think of another um, group like that. Um, well, the part, the local parties, like the local Democratic or Republican parties, um, if you want to talk to, you know, activists. Um, but if you, I guess if you want more unbiased type voters, you're going to have to go to non-political sources. So I guess that would be more like industry groups um, or even like the PTA, like a, a, a you know, um, a homeowners association. Um, I'm sorry, were you asking like regular people or you mean like sources? I like see about regular like, people. Sometimes at the end of the day your, your editor says, can you get some real voters saying something about this? I was going to say tourist sites. Like tourist sites. Like tourist sites? I always find a range of people in front of the White House oh. or um, like some of the museums, really, in some of the museums. You'll find people like from Oklahoma, oh, and thing. you know, if, if you that want, like, that just seems like that would be less targeted, and that would be kind of exhausting. Like, are you from Oklahoma? Are you from Oklahoma? Oh, uh, if you're looking for someone <laughs> from a specific <laughs> no, that's state, that's the thing. regular if people are sources. Like, just need, like, I'm covering this district race. Like, well, she means regular people, but from the fourth congressional district. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's what I was asking. Yeah, sources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would think like uh, PTA would probably be the best. Um, like you could kind of Google like a school, a high school in that area. Mm -hmm. I guess you have to be pretty, you have to be like sort of resourceful and entrepreneurial, but you know, thank God for the internet. Sometimes right. that would be one area that it would be helpful. Um, where else or, could you or call? Partner with a partner. Informally with a community newspaper. Mm -hmm. 
right in that area. Yeah. Could you know could give you fifteen people probably and. I mean, you could even call, like, um, local, like, obviously, you're not going to call, like, a chain store, but, like, if you called, if you, through Google, were able to identify, like, if there was, like, a main street or something with, like, you know, the local whatever, um, the local bakery, the, lo you know, store owners, mm -hmm. that like might a, be one way. Like a neighborhood watch group, too. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I also I think about that I also more. feel like... I have a network of people way bigger than I realized just from like where friends from high school have ended up and thing and then like when you multiply that by a newsroom I feel like in most newsrooms if you sent out an email like does anyone know anyone in this city that might have some friends who could talk or you put out a call on your Facebook page or your Twitter um, like I'm always surprised by how extensive, like, across the country my network is when I actually think about, like, do I know anyone in this state? I often do. I only know this because of my roommate, um, but DC has, like, a lot of, like, um, local, like, sports bar followings that are, like, dedicated for, like, uh, yeah. West Country mm -hmm. Badgers or whatever. Oh, um, that's a good idea. And, uh, again, this is not me, but uh, my roommate, like, he'll go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll, go to, uh, he'll, go, <laughs> he'll go to, like, every game, and he's met, you know, tons of people from, like, Wisconsin. Um, and you know those people living in DC. Oh, uh, that's voters, a good idea. We're certainly gonna have like families. Ah, oh, that's really DC. smart. And at the very least, be able to like talk to you about how they love or hate. You know, like, or like, like a Wisconsin service or group, like um, and a lot of university Kiwanis or something here, like yeah. University of yeah. Miami. They all have alumni groups. Yeah. They're actually also state, state associations. Societies. Yeah, like retirement homes. They're very, they're very, all the people, they have a lot of time, they're very, they're very bold, they're very willing. That's true. And a lot of the retirement homes will have like a little, and the retirement homes will have like a, like a government, you know, like, can I speak to the president or the, yeah. You know, and they're not part of, you know, they're going to have opinions, but they're not going to be like working for the Democratic Party or something necessarily. When I Florida, I suspected that 90% of the people commenting were retired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some political reporting is kind of categorized um, based on that horse race. Um, how do you kind of distinguish your story um, when everyone's reporting on this poll, and especially in the final days of the campaign when it is all about the numbers? Yeah, I mean, probably in the final days, it's it's kind of hard to get away from that. And um, but yeah, you obviously want to keep the reporting on polls to a minimum. But polls can be good nuggets within stories. I mean. I don't like to write a story unless I have to, like for the blog, just that's just about a poll. But sometimes the poll will illustrate like something that, you know, a bigger story that you want to tell. Um, so I think that can be helpful. But, you know, you like I said before, you want to set the agenda. Like, I want to write about this issue, or I want to write about whether they're reaching these kind of voters, or I want to write about a new campaign tactic that I see, you know, more stuff online than on television, or. Um, this candidate is actually going door to door, um, I want, you know, go out with them, like try to be creative and ingenious about the stories that you want to write and try to keep the stories that the campaigns want you to write and the polls like to a minimum. It's not easy, but it's, you just got to strike a balance and make sure you're doing both. Yeah. So this is kind of a specific, um, case scenario, but how do you... So in terms of like tuning your BS detector, when you cover something day in, day out, you're like, that person has said that 15 times in the past week, like not a story. And then someone who isn't covering the campaign day in, day out will like drop in for that day and get this like huge story, you know, out of this thing that you've heard them say a million times. Or I mean, or you might write something off because it seems so like mundane, but someone else kind of sees it as like, right. you know, so like how do you deal with that kind of like, almost fatigue when you're covering a campaign yeah often. yeah I mean they you know people call it like being in the bubble yeah. you know like all you know is what the campaign says and and you 
I mean, I think you just got to break out. You got to say today, I'm not going to get on the can- on the press bus. I'm going to go, you know, go over to the Starbucks and talk to voters. Like you have to, you know, force yourself to get away from the pack. Um, and you know, like sometimes I see what you're saying. Like that could be annoying. Like another reporter hears something that you have heard so many times, they think it's a story, and you're like old wise and veteran no it's not but you know sometimes that kind of outside um look is uh i I mean actually this this isn't exactly comparable but the the jab story that i wrote last week about um the signals that he's kind of quietly sending out about 2016 was in part because another reporter in the newsroom heard something that i had heard have heard a while and I've been covering Jeb a while and I just kind of thought well everyone knows that about Jeb everyone knows he's running for president that's not or that he's thinking about running for president that's not that interesting and he was like yeah it is and this is the Wall Street Journal we care about everything Jeb does so that was a little bit like that like I didn't really think he and I was like yeah I've had people so he's like you have that's a story and I, I actually didn't think it was that much of a story but then he Whatever. So um, anyway, I think we have to be open to sometimes what what outsiders and and editors see because we can get kind of desensitized when we hear it so many times. But the you know the advantage to um, to seeing a candidate many many times is that you know when they go off script. Oh, this is something new, and like the reporter who's never seen them before has no idea that's uh, you know a change in in their tone or in substance. Um, and so that's the one really, really good advantage. Yeah. So I apologize if I'm like the only journalist on the planet that does not know the answer to this question. So right off the bat. So I'll notice sometimes in the Wall Street Journal there'll be a story about um, a political issue. Not so much one campaign, but like a political issue. And they will find some author somewhere who is about to have a book come out. Now I know all of our Simon Desk, we get these books that the publisher, but that's not it. Like they have they found an author who's specifically looking at, you know, billionaires who fund super PACs or huh. and it's coming up in four months or whatever. How do you find those authors? That, I mean, is there like a master list I'm missing somewhere? Or, I mean, I just, I'm always impressed when the journalist tracks down this author who's been working for two years on this book and it's coming out in four months or whatever. Wow. And it's specifically on point, so it's not like, you know, somebody's shoveling it down in their throat. Um, and I didn't know, because I've seen I, it in the journal, and I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know. That's probably like what you described, is that, you know, people want to get in the Wall Street Journal, and so they're they're reaching out. They're promoting it's themselves. It's so on point, though. I'm like, there must be a master guide of, of people probably, about to release books. There or something probably are some, you know, online things, thing like that. But I, I actually okay. don't know what it is. Yeah, so I I'm with you. I, some of the publishing houses have... Like listers that you can sign up for. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's it. Tell okay. You, you know, when books on yeah. Hi. Um, so one question I have is something I'm actually doing recently is we're trying to reach out to someone to get close to somebody um, that is kind of a big name. I think you mentioned Hillary, Hillary Clinton. Like the only reason we got to Hillary Clinton was for a book. But like, um, if there's someone else and they just keep telling you no or they just keep writing you off, when is I mean, I guess it depends on the story, and a lot of it is trading favors. I mean, you know, if a press secretary wants you to write a story that you weren't planning to write, but isn't that much of a, isn't a big deal? I mean, you'd be like, yeah, I'll write that if, if I get access to this person. Um, that might be a way. I mean, I think it is just for you a judgment call on how important that story is for you. Um, sometimes people admire persistence. I, I've, some of my best sources, like when I first started calling them, would not give me the time of day. And it was, um, you know, it took time. It took time. It took, you know, maybe a, a dinner with a bottle of wine. Um, in some cases, it just took persistence. Um, a lot of times, if if people will not turn you down, if you just say, "Can I just meet you for? Can I just buy you a cup of coffee? Can I buy you a cup of coffee?" That's kind of hard for someone to turn down. So, um, and once they see you, and you can kind of prove that you're, you know. Exactly. Uh, and be really, you know, as charming as I'm sure you are in person, then usually can win someone over that way. 
so I would just say, I, I you know, when can I, can I, I really just like to buy you a cup of coffee or a sandwich, make it really low key, meet you after, you know, meet, can I buy you a drink? Drinks help sometimes. Um, I can't think of his name very well in American, Eric Cantor. Mm-hmm. Uh, his defeat seems to be a surprise to everybody. It seems like all the reporters had pre retained that he was going to slide into the media right. and everything. And then it was something else happened. How does that change the way you are approaching the November elections? Knowing that things could. You know, it, ch- it only changes in that that is like another lesson for us that, like, don't. Don't ever think that you know what you know that everything is predictable. Like things are just so volatile. Who in a million years would have thought Barack Obama would be president? Who in a million years thought think Eric Cantor would be defeated? Like politics is always surprising us. You know, don't don't give in to the conventional wisdom. Like always challenge yourself. Always challenge your thinking. Always challenge what everyone else is thinking. I just think it's a really good reminder that um, we always have to kind of be on our toes. Um, We've all been caught, you know, flat-footed with, with a story like that. In fact, I'll tell you, this is embarrassing, but that night, I mean, I'm never, ever without my cell phone, ever, ever, ever. The one, I swear to God, the only time in my entire life I've ever left my cell phone at home and went out to dinner was the night of Eric Canner's loss. <laughs> and I got home, and I had, like, 50 voicemails and emails. Luckily, I mean... They're not just depending on me. There was someone else who could pick up the story. And I did then get involved and, and help with our coverage. But um, I had, yeah, I was completely caught unaware. So, um, What are some beginner mistakes that you made when you started out covering politics in Florida? Things that you look back on and you're like, okay, if I would have known better. Oh, that's a good question. I'm still making so many mistakes. <laughs> um, Um, here's, here's a question. Yeah. Would you ever again be in the same childbirth preparation class with the state college? <laughs> yeah, right. That <laughs> actually has happened to me. That has happened to me. Was she in Congress? Was she in the U.S. Congress? No, I don't, well, probably not. Yeah, yeah this is Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who, um, <laughs> when I worked at the Miami Herald, uh, you know, I knew her as just a lowly, uh, state representative from Broward County, and um, we did, we were in the same childbirth class. <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> um, and my recollection is Beth wanted to talk politics, but Debbie only wanted to talk like, yeah. babies. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably true. Or maybe it was the other way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, okay, mistakes. I'm not I'm not coming with an a- answer because I'm not making mistakes. I'm making so many mistakes, I can't even think of one. Um, <laughs> Is there a story you wish you would have, if you'd had a second chance, you could do it differently? Um, I mean, mostly because the editor screwed it up. <laughs> Never Linda, of course, but um, yes. I'd like to do every story differently. Um, like maybe in terms of the way you wrote the stories back then, and now you like obviously are a more polished writer now than. I mean, I think in the beginning, like you know, if I looked at my early, and this would not be true of not just politics stories, any kind of stories. I think they were you know probably read a lot of very he said she said kind of stories, and certainly can fall into that with campaigns, you know. He said she's a terrible person, and she said he's a terrible person, and and your story kind of just reads like a ping pong game. And you know the best political reporting is like someone who is who has done the homework and then can kind of like tell you how it is. And that's not editorializing or your opinion. Like that's really like educated analysis, and you're you're really doing the reader a favor by kind of like separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And I'm sure. In my early stories, I was really bad at that, and and probably you know you still have trouble doing that, um, but um, at its best, you know you you're very familiar with the topic, you know the record, you know the candidates, and you know who's who's being straight up and who isn't, and you can signal that to your readers, and back it up with quotes and facts without editorializing. Um, and there's way too much of that these days. I, I actually, um, like, since I was in college, my goal was to be a columnist. It sounds even old-fashioned to use that word now. Um, and 
uh, I don't want to be a columnist anymore because like everyone is a columnist these days, right? I mean, I think like the stories I admire the most are the ones that really like are, are much more, you know, investigative and, and people who are diggers as opposed to pundits. So. What's been your most exciting story or your favorite story that you've worked on? Huh. I mean, I guess I've gotten different things out of stories. Like, um, you know, probably the story I had, I wrote that had that had an impact um, was when I was covering the the Senate race at, uh, for the Miami Herald between um, Charlie Crist and Marco Rubio. Um, I got a hold of, of Rubio's um, credit card bills from his state party credit card. He had a state party American Express that he was supposed to be using for political activities. And um, there were a lot of personal expenses on it. And it wasn't just him. A lot, we wrote stories about him and a lot of other people who were using their state party American Express for personal stuff. And that was really, really fun. And like, what was so fun about that is like we had the goods, we had the records. Like that doesn't you know happen very often. And was that like how did you a get tip it? or a FOIA kind of thing? Yeah. No, it wasn't a FOIA. Like that was private. It was someone leaked it to me. Um, but it was like it was a ton of work, like putting it all into spreadsheets and everything. Um, I guess it just it looked like American Express bills, and I mean they never disputed that it was not his bills. Um, and anyway, that he still run the race, I guess. So I guess it had a limited impact on that campaign. But I mean, I think it's ha it'll be something that will follow Rubio. Um, and so that was a big story. Um, it was a and very he, he ended up paying back a lot of money. He right? did end up paying back some money. Yeah. Um, but you know, I've also really enjoyed like much more quieter stories where I was on the ground with with voters. Um, I did a story at National Journal where I went to, what we did was we looked at, I looked at the counties with the highest, the, the top 100 counties in the country with the worst unemployment. And I looked at whether Obama or Romney had been in any of those counties in an, in a, in an election that was at least uh, on the surface supposed to be about jobs, right? Um, and it turned out neither of them had been to any of these counties except Mitt Romney had had a, a fundraiser in one of them. And so um, that was kind of the basis for the story. And then I went to the county in Ohio, which was like the most well-traveled state, and the county in Ohio with the worst unemployment, where uh, you know voters were like had never seen a presidential candidate, and felt had very strong feelings about both Obama and Romney. They kind of felt Obama had sold them out and Romney couldn't care less about them and um, you know spent time talking to the voters in that county um, and it wasn't a swing county that um, you know where where uh, which is really how candidates determine where they go it's not based on unemployment or things like that it's based on where the votes are right um, and so that was like that was a special story for me because it combined both some data um, so it was grounded in data, but also in real people, and, and it had some of the big themes of the campaign. So I really enjoyed um, enjoyed that. So um, those would be two of my favorites. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that uh, you write your stories uh, to make sense to your mom, make it accessible to your mom. But for story, like for like foreign policy stories, so for example, Hillary Clinton talking about Syria. How do you bring that back to the being accessible? Because foreign policy itself is not very like reader friendly to begin with. Yeah. So. Um, thankfully, they don't make me write about that too much, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we all have to be prepared to write about everything, right? Um, so. I mean, that's tough. I think that you, again, have to ask yourself, why would a regular voter care about something that may seem very distant and, and very far away and not relevant to their everyday lives? Um, and um, you have to try to answer that question in your story. Um, and um, what is what are we learning about Hillary Clinton from the, what she's saying? Um, 
is another question you want to answer. Has she revealed something that she hasn't previously revealed to us? Um, and you're going to have to do your homework more on that kind of a story than others if you're not an expert on foreign policy, which, which I'm not. Um, you're going to have to do reading, and ideally you have someone in your newsroom that you can run that by who maybe does cover that more than you do. Um, you know, I, we have, you know, national security experts or, you know, people who write about national security at the journal that I might run that story by. Um, maybe that's a story where you kind of do more what we were talking about earlier with a, with a source. You know, let me make sure I have this right. You know, so this and this and this is the way I'm explaining it. And then your, you know, foreign policy expert, your think tank person or whatever is going to say, no, you don't have that quite right. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'm finding since I've started doing cybersecurity is that um, especially cybersecurity, which is both technology and security, is a very male-dominated field. And when you're trying to build sources, you know, like you're saying, can I buy you a drink? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? There's just some times where things are weird, and I imagine campaigns also plays it. So if you could talk a little bit about how you've managed, like, any gender weirdness that has come up. Yeah. And what you do. Well, um, it's probably helpful always to pay for yourself. I mean, so, like, no one ever thinks it's a date, <laughs> you know, even if it's just a drink, you know. Like, I'm usually pretty um, pushy about that. And, like, I'll even, they'll be like, oh, it's just one drink. And I'll say, oh, but, you know, I'll get in trouble if I, you know, which is sort of true, but not really, you know. Obviously, no one's going to get fired for letting a source buy you a drink, but... Um, you know, you do have to keep those boundaries. Um, and if there's anything else that you've found, like, has become an issue for you, like, ever? I mean, I find a lot of times in talking to people, they'll say, well, you know, you're my friend. Or uh, between, you know, I can say this to you as a friend. And I'm always tempted just to let that lie. Like, okay, let them think that. But, like, I usually try to be disciplined and be like, you know, just to be clear, we're not friends, you know, I really like, you know, I like you, we're friendly, but we are not friends. Um, and, you know, there's also, like, a lot of, like, hugging and kissing that goes on. People want to hug and kiss me when they see me, and I try to be, like, proactive about putting the hand out sometimes <laughs> to avoid the smooch, which sometimes can be awkward, you know, like. <laughs> um so I guess that's the thing. But, you know, you also, um, you don't want to be too stiff. You want to be friendly. So it's just a, it's a balance, like, with everything else. Um, but, um, and, yeah, I mean, you're probably going to have to, like, you know, try to find some, you know, because you want your source list to be diverse. You're going to have to try to find those few women who work in your field and, and reach out to them. But um, you probably are going to end up interacting more with men just because that's the nature of your of your beat um so um you know i guess probably you always want to err on the side of um making sure those boundaries are there and not to get yourself in trouble and not to be you know like uh what someone over here or no you said about like you know i want to be fair to you so yeah um, what can you share some of the best ways you think to just go about finding stories? How do I go about finding stories? Um, well, I guess there's a few ways. I mean, I look at Twitter as kind of as a tip sheet a little bit, what other people are writing about. Um, I, when I'm covering a campaign, I have I will you know sometimes put those folks that I'm writing about on Google Alerts. And so sometimes those, those will turn up the big stories that say, you know, the Los Angeles Times is writing about Marco Rubio, which I want to know what they're writing. But sometimes it will also turn up, like, smaller things that Marco Rubio is doing. He's speaking at something or someone blogs something about him that will, like, spark ideas. Um, so those are just kind of, like, rudimentary things that I do. Um, I mean, part of it comes just sort of naturally, um, you know, from observing the candidate or, you know, watching, watching what they say or do and always going back to the record to see whether there's any discrepancies on that. 
you know, following the money? Are they talking about issues that their contributors want them to talk about? Or are they straying from it? Does this match what they said last week? Um, Beth, can I ask you a corollary question? Yeah. Do you have any tips for these people on how to deflect your editor when he or she suggests a story that you know is going to really suck? Um, I mean, you you have to be proactive about always having that good story on the back burner, that once a month story that you're working on. Um, if I if I do that, then I'm not going to have time to finish this great you know front page story or this story that's going to get so much traffic, and uh, I'm just like two or three phone calls away from getting that done. And so your best defense is is offense, is always having that um, that story that you're working on. Um, is the only is is usually the only way to get an editor off your back. Um, how else do I get story ideas? I mean, remember story. that calling. Remember what I said about calling people without an agenda and just saying what should I be writing about. That's one way I do it. Um, and I I do that by email too when I'm lazy or, or on a Sunday night sometimes when I'm like feeling some anxiety about the week ahead. I don't have anything to write about. I'll send out a bunch of emails. Maybe the person won't look at it till Monday or Tuesday, but um, if I send out ten emails and maybe one or two people respond with a have, you know with a decent story about what's up coming up ahead, um, you can kind of get out more emails sometimes than you can get out phone calls. Um, and so, um, you know, you want your stories to be organic to actually come from the ground, not just from like, oh, what should I write about this week? You know, or your editor's head even worse. So. Um, I think just reaching out to people is going to be your best bet. And, um, you know, also, obviously, to some degree, you're, you're following what the campaign, you know, is putting out in press releases. That's, that's part of your job is reflecting what the candidate is saying. I keep saying candidate. I know that I should not just be focusing on campaign so much. I'm sorry. I'm just, like, in my head in campaign mode. Where do you want to be on election night? Where? At my desk with a big slice of pizza and a <laughs> big die No, um, where would I like to be? I would like to be. I mean, it'd be fun to be in Kentucky, mm -hmm. though. I'm not sure how close that race is going to be in the end. Um, but you can imagine Mitch McConnell having a pretty good, like, victory party. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, let's see. Where else will be what fun? What do you think your role will be? I mean, will you be on the ground somewhere, or will you be... You know, we haven't more? talked about that yet. Probably not. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is very macro um, when it comes to the midterms, and um, we also have folks in bureaus, so, like, they'll maybe be spread out between victory parties. Plus, you can get so much from watching TV these days. Like, I don't need to be at Mitch McConnell's headquarters to see what he says on election night. Um, so I think it's actually even too early to decide because things are still so volatile. I think, you know, it's hard to know. And I think we'll know like more in the last week or two where the best spots to be on campaign night will be. Um, probably not Alaska. Probably not Alaska. <laughs> well, maybe Alaska. Well, if I was going to go to Alaska, yeah, I'd rather have already gone. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not now. Yeah. Yeah. When you're working on a story, why do you get conflicting information from people on the same side of the story? So say, um, I actually ran into this situation last week where there's a prominent former politician who's involved in the election that I'm covering, and someone on the candidate side is doing one thing that the press secretary for this former politician then said was not true once they filed. And then did you go back to the person who told you it? And I what did, did they say? He said that it was true. I mean, it just became, I just ended up removing it because there's clearly some internal miscommunication because they're separate yet working on the same side. And I know that's kind of a unique situation, but yeah. generally I feel like, especially given the campaign itself tells you something else right. well I guess you have to think about their motives um, 
that's a you know and and i would like you like you did i think you handled it as well as you could you know go back to the other person and be like well the nrcc is telling me this and you're telling me this um get your story straight yeah all right, I apologize, we are out of time. You guys have had fabulous questions, so congratulations to you. Great, great first session. And Beth, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Now Beth, I believe in the